Well, the lightning you can see on the screen is supposed to symbolise the judgement that our passage speaks about. Does lightning make you a little nervous? Well, the thought of judgement does too. I remember reading about Martin Luther some years ago. He lived centuries ago, of course. And uh, he sensed that God was his judge when he was running through a thunderstorm with lightning strikes nearby. It's one of those near-death experiences that's got a way of changing your perspective. But I want to tell you another story. I was thinking of Colin Darch when I read this story some years ago. Uh, It came to my mind because of you, Colin. Um, It's about a young immigrant soldier who I think was registering and had joined recently a regiment in, I think it was the Australian Army, I'm not, sh- I'm not certain. Anyway, he was an immigrant and the story goes like this, he had a lot of trouble with English. And uh, he had been told that a big inspection day was coming. And he was trying to learn from his larrikin mates in his new regiment. The other men had been there a lot longer Most of them spoke English very easily and they were trying to help this new guy get ready for the big day when the general was coming to inspect all the troops. Well, have you ever faced an inspection day like that? I used to face them quite regularly and they used to make me quite nervous. Exams, inspections, assessments, yearly reviews, Have you ever faced something like that? Well, this man was quite scared. So his brothers in arms said to him something like this. Look, mate, the general almost always asks just three questions. All you've got to do is practice the answers to these three questions. And today I want to talk about three questions, even more important ones. But this man was very, very worried. He was very teachable. And they said, now the first question the general normally asks, when he senses that you're new, he'll stop and he will say this. He will say, how old are you, son? This is your answer. Sound it out with me. 20, 22 years. Can you say that? 22 years. He practiced it a few times. And then they said to him, look, um, The general always asks a second question. He always asks, how long have you been in the army, son? And you need to say to him, not not in this regiment, but how long in the army? Two years. Sound it out with me, two years. And then the major, he's a major general, I think, and he will ask this question. He will say, are they taking good care of you, son? And is the food good? Now, you do not want the general to ask you anything else. You want to finish the conversation as quickly as possible because you do not want him to discover how bad your English is. He'll think it's dangerous or something like that. So, when he asks, are they taking good care of you, son? And is the food good? Just shoot back the answer really quickly. Both. Just say that. 22 years, two years, both. You've already guessed what happened, haven't you? (laughs) He asked the questions in a different order. Have you ever faced an exam like that where they're not the... Well, the day came, the general came in, he's assessing all the truths, he's moving down the ranks, and he just paused at this new guy, saw he was new. You must be new here. How long have you been in this unit? Young immigrant shoots back, 22 years. (laughs) He looks around, he sees the other soldiers are smiling a little bit, a little nervous, but a little smile there as well. And the general looks at them and then looks back at the guy, okay, soldier, how old are you? (laughs) Two years, he says. And he says, what do you take me for, an idiot or a fool? And he says, both. <laughs> That's how some of my exams have gone. What about you? Have you ever been 
like under a misunderstanding about what the questions would be for an exam. Um, maybe you've prepared answers. Maybe sometimes the examiner will tell you what the questions are even. But because of my childhood experiences, I used to find exams quite terrifying. I remember the last exam I ever sat for at the University of Queensland was an entirely optional exam. I had always aced all of those kinds of exams before. I didn't even need to do it because I was a postgraduate student. It was an optional subject. I remember walking out of the exam room and I felt like my feet were not touching the ground. I just felt so relieved. Have you ever felt relieved after an exam? Sometimes I'm still worried, I might add. But anyway, what is it that we fear? I fear that my parents would think I was a complete waste of space. But who looks forward to an exam anyway? Do you know anyone who actually enjoys written examinations that go for three or four or five hours? No. The same is true for us when we think about the prospect of facing the judge of heaven and earth. It's a prospect that we do not naturally look forward to, is it? Not, not ordinarily. Do you really look forward to that kind of detailed examination? And the Bible tells us whether we're Christians or not, we all face some kind of assessment, either the examination of believers' works or that final judgment before the throne of God. Well, I want to think very carefully with you today about three questions that God is not asking you. Is that good news? There are three questions He is not asking you. How should you get ready for this level of examination that I'm talking about that happens at the end of your life or at the end of history, whether you're ready or not, whether you're a believer or not, how should you be glad to face God's judgment? How do you face that kind of inspection? Different passages of the Bible tell us about many different aspects of this assessment, but it's a very strong biblical theme and we are warned that we will all face that form of judgment of some sort. Now, there are three disturbing questions that come up in our own hearts, even if I were not to tell you what mine are today, I think you'd recognise them anyway, eventually. The prospect of being assessed stimulates certain doubts and questions within us. And when I speak to you of this final judgement, the issue is, what are we going to do with these questions that will naturally rise up within us? And the first question I want to address is the question of, have I got a good chance of being found acceptable, having a chance of reward or of heaven? And some people think, well, yes, yes, I do. And others feel, I have no chance at all. Some people even resent the idea of judgment and they deny that the creator God of the Bible has any competence or any commitment to follow through on that judgment. Well, one thing is clear. When we mention that phrase, judgment day, to people, along with the idea that God even has us under inspection now, even in this moment, right this second, he has us under his assessment now. We dread the very idea of standing before him unless we're reassured in special ways. We know, for instance, most of us have lived lives where we've been largely disinterested in God, knowing that we haven't become like Jesus. Most people get about as excited as facing God with that history behind them as they are about the whole topic of death. And death's not a very popular topic either, is it? So I must ask you, if 
very specifically, what do you think these questions are and where do you think we can answer them? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that the three most common questions are answered for us in Romans chapter 4, verse 5. You can see it printed at the top of your notes page. You might like to just turn to it. There's a very encouraging message in this verse for every one of us because it tells us how we can stand confident when we're facing Judgment Day. Because this verse tells us how we can stand perfected, how we can stand accepted, accepted by God the Father as accepted as Jesus, His very own Son, is accepted by God the Father. Not after five more years of religious self-improvement plans, uh, not after uh, a long process, but this verse tells us, by implication, how we can stand ready today. Today, you can enjoy a standing of acceptance with God just as great, just as warm as the standing that Jesus enjoys before God the Father. So let's have a look at this verse. Romans 4 verse 5. Now, there are three questions that are answered here. And these questions are not being asked by God. People who believe in Jesus in some vague sense still tend to worry about these three questions too. So I think these words in Romans 4 verse 5 are for all of us. And I think it would be helpful, perhaps if we just paused and read them again, Romans 4 verse 5, where it says this. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. What does that mean? Well, the first question that you can answer from this text is the question that plagues a lot of us. Have you done enough? Whether we've done enough good works, whether we've done enough good things, whether we've gotten done all the things we assume we've got to get done for anyone to be happy with us, let alone God. When I talk to people who face death, as I often do, some people are seriously disconnected from reality. And they often say things like, I couldn't possibly die now. I have so much that I have to get done. And even people who know that they will be facing God as judge at the end of their lives, they think they've got to get things done to satisfy Him too. Well, how many people are there like that here today, I wonder, mistakenly worrying about this idea that God's opinion of you will depend on how much you've gotten done for Him? You might not consciously think when God... Uh, well, you might not consciously think of God when you ask yourself this question, what have I got to get done? But if you did think about the Lord when you asked yourself that question, you think, what have I got to get done? What have I got to get done this year? What have I got to get done with the rest of my life? And you thought of Him as you asked that question, then you'd be reassured by what God really says in this verse. People naturally assume that the more they get done in terms of good works, good religious works in this life, then the more you increase your chances of being accepted in heaven. I want to suggest an experiment for everyone here today, for all of you to try out. I want to suggest that you go from this place this week and try asking someone, just anyone, and if you're more courageous, not a member of your family, someone who's a stranger perhaps, maybe someone at work, ask this question. Do you think you're going to heaven? Now, do not ask that question in an accusatory tone of voice. That won't go well. You could ask instead, do you think God fully accepts you? 
Are you willing to ask at least one other person that question this week? I'd be interested in learning what happens. If you can ask 10 people, do that too. What do you think people are going to say to you? Listen to exactly what they say in their answer. Most probably they'll say these two words. I'm trying. Or I'm still working on that. Sometimes they might show you something else by the look on their face or the tone in their voice. They might show you, I've given up on that. Somehow people always hear a question, whether it's someone like you asking them or whether it's the Prince of Darkness, have you done enough good deeds? But my friend, that is the first question which God is not asking us. Not according to Romans 4 verse 5. That's not the question nor the issue. Look at verse 5 carefully on the screen. It's written for the benefit of people, people who are being accepted. And it says, it's him who does not work. In this context, it's about people who are being accepted by God. And it says that this is an acceptance which is for those who do not work. Specifically, not work for that acceptance. It's given to someone who does not do acts of achievement, even spiritual disciplines. God doesn't accept anyone on the basis of how many good works you've performed. That is not the basis. God tells us here as well, why he cannot accept anyone on that basis. Do you see what that reason is? Look back in verse 4. Do you see verse 4? To him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Do you understand the principle there in verse 4? If God were to accept you on the basis of good works, he'd be paying off a debt he owed you by paying you something that he owed you. But that's not what the Bible is saying here. The God of the Bible is saying that he won't be in debt to anyone. And this is not the only place in the Bible where you can find this principle. Does anyone think that God is in your debt? This is a very bad idea to believe that. Let's suppose that you owned a very spacious mansion down on the shores of Ocean Beach or maybe at Hillary's Harbour. Suppose you own some luxury penthouse apartments like that and I came to you looking for a nice place to stay in the future. Maybe a few years ago when I had four children staying at home so it would be a real challenge for you and it would be very worrying and I came to you and I said what can I do so that we can come and live in your complex, maybe next door to your nice penthouse. And he might say, or if you were the owner, you might say, well, um, sure, David, I can, I can do that. Uh, you just got to do the following list of things for me. You've got to work for my company and help us make a profit for 20 years. Uh, you do that in the local Wanneroo branch, not in the more luxurious one. And, uh, well, you also need to do a few other things. And I say, well, what sort of things? Well, you've got, to, you've got to get along with all my friends at Gospel Baptist Church and you've got to do community work. I want you to do about 25 hours a week on top of the 60 or 70 hours you might do at, at the centre in Wanneroo. And suppose I say, well, that sounds like a reasonable deal. George, Fred, whatever your name is, you're the owner. You get to say, sure, I'll do that. How long have I got to do that for? Well, you say 20 years. So what would happen if I arrived at your place after 20 years of working like that without any pay and I just said, well, are you going to let, let us in now? Is it, it's time. What would you be doing if you let us in? Wouldn't you just be paying a debt? Giving me something I earned? Paul says, God is not like that. He doesn't have heaven as a place for people who have earned something. It's simple. Admittance to heaven is so that you will enjoy a relationship with him 
and it is given to us by grace, at no cost to us, not by him paying off a debt for our services. Probably most of us have heard this principle before at church, if we've been here, we've filed the idea away though, perhaps in the back of our minds and forgotten Somehow we tend to assume or think that the more we get done down here, the more acceptable we will be to God on Judgment Day. But what the Lord is saying to us here in verses 4 and 5 is that if I were to accept you on the basis of your good works, I would just be in your debt and that's impossible. So what the Bible is saying here is that God cannot be in debt to anyone and Romans 4 verse 5 makes it perfectly clear that God is not inspecting you by asking you the question, how many good works have you gotten done? His acceptance is for those who are not working in that way. Well, that's the first thing that we tend to worry about, getting enough done. But there's a second question that God is not asking as well. And there it is on the screen. Now, you might be a child in a family and you might find this thought comes to mind very quickly. How well have you outwardly behaved? You might be a student at school. You might be asking that question. But you might be a spouse and you might ask yourself, hmm, according to the way that I've been responded to lately, the question comes to my mind, how well have I outwardly behaved? As a pastor in biblical studies uh, lecturer, I've often visited many churches and Bible study classes and at some times it's very, very disappointing because sometimes preaching and teaching stays mainly on the topic of how we ought to behave outwardly and that's a bit disappointing because there's a lot more to life than that and a lot more to a relationship with Christ, I might add. Sadly, in many church circles and in our society generally, we think that we've got the main message of the Bible if we can manage our outward behaviour in such a way that it's in accord with biblical ethical principles. Nothing wrong with biblical ethical principles, but we think it's just a matter of conforming to that outwardly. Now, our behaviour is important, especially as Christians, after our conversion and later on when we're in a relationship. But the Gospel, according to Paul here, reminds us that regarding this matter of our acceptance by God, God is not asking us the question, how well have you outwardly behaved? Nor is he saying, how good's your performance? No. One of the other common responses when we ask people that question in your homework, that question, are you going to heaven? One of the most responses, the common responses from some people, especially if they've been around churches a little bit, they say something like this. Well, I think I stand a better chance of heaven than some other people I know. And sometimes they will look in your direction. Sometimes they may look disdainfully around you if you're a preacher because they think that they behave better than a lot of people in churches. Well, if you were to ask them, why do you think that their chances are better than others? They might be brave enough to tell you what's going on inside of them. Well, they think, well, because I've never done this thing or that thing, I don't, and I don't poke my nose into other people's business like you preachers, they think that they're pretty good. They're very nice people, they think. The problem with this kind of approach is God is not asking us the question, how well have we outwardly behaved? Look at the middle of verse 5 again. Do you see that phrase? God's acceptance of people is on, in the old King James, someone who believeth on him or believes on him. And the basic idea of that word believe there, the first foundation of it is trusting. So you could express part of the idea here at least as being justified and accepted by God and it's for someone who does not work for that acceptance, but rather someone who trusts God, who justifies the ungodly. So, do you see what the basic issue here is? It's about trustingly believing on the God who justifies even ungodly people. So the basic issue is this, it's about trusting God, it's about believing, it's a matter of inward believing 
not outward behaving. So Paul's contrasting two things which you might be depending upon for your acceptance by God. And these two things are as different as chalk and cheese, even though they look similar from a distance. There's a relationship between works and trusting God, but it's not that you work in order to become trust, to be accepted by God. Paul's contrasting these two things, and he tells us here why God cannot just accept you on the basis of outward behaviour. And why is that? Well, no matter how well you might behave outwardly, how does he describe us inwardly? Look at that verse. He looks at me, he looks at my performance, he looks at the whole of my life, he looks at David Bond or whoever you are, and what does he say about us ordinarily, naturally speaking? ungodly. That's the nicest thing that he could say about me. In fact, if we were using the old English expression, it would be (coughs) wicked, (laughs) but I'll go with ungodly. So, this expression, ungodly, is what he's saying about us, and he can justify even the ungodly. He can accept us, he can forgive the ungodly, and we are automatically included in that, that category. The very evidence that we belong in that category is that we dare to think that we have only a little need of God's acceptance. That's one evidence of it straight away. But the reality is that otherwise, God could only be in the business of accepting pretty good people. Whoever that is, would certainly exclude me by this description. God says, no, I make available this special acceptance to people like you, David, ungodly people, ordinary people, unfaithful people, people who fail like you, David. And that would be you too. What does the Bible mean when it says that it describes someone as ungodly? Let's have a think about that for a second. It means that we haven't lived our lives in awe of God. Is that how you started your life? Living in awe of God? It means that we haven't seen how valuable, how beautiful, how wonderful God actually is, rather than all the fake news that's published against Him. And there's plenty of that. It means that inwardly my heart has not been as appreciative and as respectful as it ought to have been to the Creator of heaven and earth. It, my heart hasn't been subdued or convinced by the goodness of God. That's not how I started life. It hasn't been captivated by the greatness and the beauty of God. That is common to human beings. So, if maybe you're thinking this morning, I'm not convinced that I should be called ungodly because I'm a just person, I'm a careful person, I'm a church goer, I'm a good citizen at least. Well, if we say that, we're missing the point. The Bible's point here is that we mustn't compare our outward behaviour with the outward behaviour of other people as if they're the standard. It's especially a matter of inward believing, a trusting attitude towards God in your heart. Now, if you're trying to think too highly about your outward behaviour by comparing yourself to others, I'll give you someone you can, can compare yourself to that puts us in a good perspective. Just compare yourself to Jesus. We don't stack up very well then, do we? You see, our worst problem is not just with outward behaviour, it's our heart. That's what Jesus taught. That's what this text is saying. Sure, our outward behaviour might be better than many other people, but it's not better than Jesus' outward behaviour. He never told a single lie. You and I have told a bunch of those, probably in a short period of time before this moment. And what's worse is this. Even if I or a war criminal are compared to Jesus in our inward attitudes, in the area of our thoughts and our values, the temptations we entertain, 
no matter what kind of person is doing that comparison to Christ, none of us compares favourably. Jesus never had one wrong thought. You and I average many of those on a regular basis. Even if you're a Christian, Jesus never just simply despised and dismissed his enemies. He was so redemptive in his approach to people. And while there have been times when you and I couldn't get along with the people in our own families or the people that were supposed to love the most, that was never the case with Jesus. He's even reaching out to Judas on the night of his betrayal. No matter how we try and avoid this, God knows everything we are on the inside and not only the things that I've quietly spoken and then not spoken because I thought the better of it, He knows those things as well. He knows my priorities and he knows yours. He knows my knee-jerk reactions. And he says one thing about me and about you. It's the best thing that he can say. Ungodly. There was once a wicked emperor called Dionysius. He had a bunch of slaves. I think that was part of his problem, actually. (laughs) A large number of slaves. And he liked to spy on them. He owned on his land a large inverted funnel type cave where it was an opening to the cave on the ground above and he put his slaves, his servants all to work at some point or other inside the cave and he'd go up the top and he'd listen where the sound funneled up. He could hear everything that people were saying and um, he gathered intelligence about people's faithfulness to him. And people were often severely punished or even lost their lives based on what they said when they thought no one was listening. Now, I want to tell you that God's intelligence gathering efforts are a lot more scary than that. He knows everything. He knows all about us inwardly. He knows our motives better than we know them ourselves. Now, of course, God is revealed in the Bible as the only perfect king. Not a wicked one, but at the same time, he knows every thought, every disloyalty, every failure to value and enjoy him. And most importantly, he knows your attitude to his beloved son. Whether you're cool to him, whether you love Jesus, whether you're grateful, he knows that completely. God the Father and God the Holy Spirit are asking you today, what do you inwardly think about my Son, the Lord Jesus Christ? That's one question that we know where that one comes from. God the Father feels the pride of you wanting to run your own life, do it your own way, invent your own values. He knows the pride that's involved in ignoring his Son, his unique Son. He knows when we think something is better or more fun than his son. (laughs) And the father takes that to heart because he is holy. And a holy God isn't a disinterested icicle. A holy God is a passionate God who unashamedly wants all of your heart for he knows what, what he is. He is really the best thing for you. And yet he looks at us and he says of us, he says about me, ungodly. That's the problem. That's the issue. Even our best outward behavior, our best periodic church going or whatever it is we think we're going to do to win God's approval, it's of no value. The issue is how we are on the inside and it's a matter of believing on his son inwardly And not just a matter of behaving on the outside of our lives. That may come later on in the Christian life, true. But let me just clarify that in two stages, what does this trusting or believing in Christ look like? This is an evangelistic message. Let's think about this for a moment. In the middle of verse 5, it's the one who believes on him, who justifies the ungodly. He can lastingly reconcile us to himself even though we're ungodly all of our earlier lives. And to justify here means that he can do something very special to you and very special in you and through you afterwards. 
He can declare you to be the opposite of what you are, his friend now. And then afterwards, he can make you such that he can relate to you so well as your friend, as your Lord, that you can be no longer at odds with him, but you can serve him well in a way that honors him, that he's pleased with. So first he declares you to be in a different standing with him and then he starts to relate to you in a new way and do things through you. And there's only one way he can give that kind of deep acceptance with himself. He doesn't develop amnesia about our sins. It's that he no longer believes and remembers our sins as being the only thing about us. He no longer remembers our sins against us. Instead, when our sins are obvious, he sees our sins laid upon Christ in the bloodshed of the cross. So that he can take our sin with all seriousness as a just judge and yet not condemn us. How can he do that? By absorbing all the consequences of sin in his own relationship with his son. By the father's own son experiencing the complete judgment of which John spoke earlier on during the Lord's Supper service. He experienced the approbation, the rejection and the separation from his father on the cross so that you and I don't need to. He died in our place. I remember when I was beginning my training as an engineer many, many years ago, a lifetime ago, I was enrolled at the University of Queensland. It was my first year and there was a very, very tragic story about engineering in a place called Sao Paulo in Brazil. There was this multi-storey building there, burned to the ground. I was in training, first year. And the results of the inquiry came out. Several of the air conditioners on the 12th floor of this building had been miswired through incompetence. Culpable human error. It was a classic case. We had to understand it. 600 employees were in that high-rise building when the fire started. 188 people, just a little bit less than a third of them, died when they, most of those ones who died jumped to their death, but not all. A quarter of the people who were in that building died because even larger crowds of people had fled up to the top floor, not just jumping, but fled upwards to get away from the smoke and the flames, and some of them managed to escape from the top floor. Now, there would have been a lot more than a quarter of these people who died up on the roof, but for one woman, a lift operator, who stayed on to operate the lifts, and she went up and down, up and down. I think she went up about, well, she went down about a dozen times. Um, taking 15 or 20 people out at a time. And they found her body in sight of that lift on one of those floors when the power stopped operating. She gave her life to keep the doorway open for other people. And that's what Christ has done for us. It's not a bad illustration of that, at least. Jesus Christ was more fully dying in your place than you ever need to experience. That's what this believing in verse 5 is about. It's about receiving and trusting in his offer. The reason why God can potentially accept you as righteous and not as ungodly is because of what Christ has done. He's kept the door open. He is the one who's paid the price. And how does that astonishing acceptance become ours to enjoy? Well, the Bible just says, believe. Believe. Trust that offer. Accept that offer. Trust someone that something they promise is true. That's what believe means. And here, in particular, we're to trust someone not only for that offer, but also trust that person to be the rightful Lord of your life. So for us to have faith and to be accepted means that we begin to personally believe and personally rely on God because of what we know about Him and what He's offering us. He's offering us acceptance. 
And that's a very personal thing. It begins a very personal relationship, a dependency on God. The favourite illustration of evangelists is probably the famous acrobat Blondin. Who hasn't heard of Blondin, the acrobat who was a tightrope walker who walked backwards and forwards so many times across Niagara Falls a long time ago? He walked that blindfolded. He walked that tightrope one time pushing a wheelbarrow. He pushed that, he he walked across that tightrope one time and he carried a stove, sat down at the midpoint, put in wood, lit it, put a fry pan on top of it, cracked eggs in it, made himself an omelette and ate it while he was sitting on the tightrope. Now, why do I tell you that story? Well, because we always hear the other one about how he carried his manager across. And Blondin explained that it was harder to carry his manager across because you have to respond to when someone's moving. I don't know, I've never driven a high-powered motorbike or something like that, but I I would imagine that you have to be a little bit careful when someone behind you on the bike moves. Well, this was worse. This is on a tightrope above Niagara Falls, hundreds of feet to a pretty difficult death below. And he said that was harder than cooking breakfast. Now, you wouldn't want to eat my breakfast even if I made it on terra firma. And you wouldn't have had an appetite to eat anything if you'd been up there in the air like Blondin was. Um, When Blondin got to the other side of Niagara Falls, uh, having carried his manager across, he asked someone in the crowd who was very vocal in his admiration, he said, okay, do you want to come back with me? I'll carry you on my back. And he said, no, thank you. Now, that's a good illustration of not trusting. So the good news is this. There is someone who is competent to carry you away from your sins. And that person is Jesus Christ. He's completely enough for us to put our faith in Him. Is that true? God is not asking you whether you've behaved well enough outwardly to be accepted. It's a matter of inwardly believing in Jesus and His capacity to carry you. It's not a matter of your outward behaviour. That's not the foundation at all. But there is a third question, and this is the question that stops a lot of people from responding. People say, I hear the gospel, I've heard about Jesus, but I'm not sure I could keep it up. Yeah, another day, another year. People sometimes postpone this crucial response till it's too late. You, you all know about how people have missed the opportunity to respond. They hear this question, it doesn't come from the Lord, can you keep it up? It's based on a common misunderstanding, even we Christians can fall into it. Many people hear the gospel, say to themselves, sounds like a dynamite retirement plan, but I don't know how long I could keep up the Christian lifestyle, all the responsibilities. And they might even think, I'm having fun now, so I'll leave that till later. What a mistake. By all means, we should consider the cost of following Jesus Christ. Counting the cost of discipleship is an important idea, but remember that God wants you to enjoy a standing of acceptance with Him, a relationship of acceptance of forgiveness with him. That's the main thing he's, he's offering. So the question, can I keep it up, misses the point. The third question on the screen is not a question that God is asking us because his plan is to draw us intimately close to him so that he helps us follow him. He's not asking, how long will you last as a practicing Christian operating under your own steam, based on your own isolated life with your own meager resources? No, 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 no. He's asking something else. Look at verse 5 again. Do you see the words? Faith is reckoned or accounted or counted it might have as righteousness, faith is counted as righteousness, 
If you've been around Bible teaching churches for long enough, you soon discover that this word count or reckon often means to credit someone something, to credit something to someone's account. Some people think of this as becoming like, uh, uh, you know, an accountant looking on one side of a ledger and another side of a ledger. You get one side payments, on another side you get liabilities, outgoing payments. And by analogy, you might say on one side you've got sin one, sin two, sin three, failure three, bad attitude four. It's a horrible list when you look at me. But on the other side, says some Christian evangelist, here's now the righteousness of Christ being added to the other side. And that cancels out and pays off all those sinful things on the other side. Now that's a nice kind of illustration, especially if you're from a financial background. Now, nothing against people from the finance sector here. It sounds good, and, but it's not a very good picture in terms of encouraging a good answer to this question. And it's not actually grabbing all of the meaning of this word count. You see, sometimes this word that the Holy Spirit led Paul to use here, sometimes it doesn't mean quantitative numerical counting out an amount of something and that's probably not how you should think of the righteousness of Christ it's not a loss or a payment of something you can measure sometimes this word count means something different different from just counting out a quantity it means getting a settled verdict from a judge there's a conflict and uh, it's used in a non-financial way more often in these chapters of Romans than it is in a financial way it doesn't simply imply a quantity of something so much as a quality of something or someone it's more about a relationship standing which is either there or it isn't there It's about whether you are accepted or rejected by the judge who's looking at you in a conflict situation. So it's not so much whether you get numerically credited with 300 units of righteousness from Jesus and it's good for you, you've only got 100 units of sin. No. God tells us here that what is being reckoned to us is a standing of righteousness. The acceptance of being in the right, in the good with God. And that's exciting because that has to do with whether God accepts you as innocent, whether he can be closely, intimately reconciled to you so that you can enter into a relationship of good standing and mutual trust so that the sacrificial work of Jesus and the leadership of Jesus operates in your life. And when you're in that kind of relationship, Jesus doesn't just leave you to cope on your own. He helps you to live the Christian life. So that question, can I keep it up on my own to live what's required in the Christian life, that doesn't come from God, that question. If I were to tell you to go out from this place and to write poetry like William Shakespeare, you might say to me, Pastor David, (laughs) I didn't even pass senior English. I couldn't write poetry like William Shakespeare. But it wouldn't be very hard at all if William Shakespeare were offering to go with you everywhere and help you to write things down and give you good ideas. How hard would it be if the spirit of William Shakespeare was in you, helping you all along through your creative endeavours? Wouldn't that be different? It is. And that's what the gospel is promising you in a relationship with God, not just a series of impossible duties that you won't be able to live up to. You're offered not just something, but someone who allows you to live, who enables you to live the Christian life. Thus, the question is certainly not whether you or I can keep it up. The issue is if God accepts you, will He keep you up? Will He sustain you? Will He strengthen you? And you know the answer to that question. 
I love the preacher, the radio preacher from the middle of the 20th century. His name is Harry Ironside. And he tells an interesting story that illustrates this really well. Uh, he went to a large sheep station. I don't know where it was. And he saw one of the most peculiar things he'd ever seen at a farm. I was back in the 50s, I think. And on this big sheep station, he saw a strange creature. Looked in a big pen. And it looked like this creature, small, had two heads instead of one. Looked like it had four front feet instead of two and four back feet instead of two. He was puzzled. It was all sheep all around. And he asked the owner about this creature that he could see just from a distance. And the, uh, I guess you could call him an industrial-sized shepherd, pastoralist, he said, well, we had a sheep give birth to a lamb. And the lamb died. Then we had another sheep bear another lamb, and this time the mother, the ewe, died. Now we needed a mother for that second lamb, so we took the first bereaved mother sheep over to the surviving lamb, but the grieving mother sheep wouldn't have a bar of that orphaned lamb. So what we did is we took the sheep skin of the mother's dead lamb and we took that sheep skin, that little fleece, and we put it over the body of the living lamb from the other mother. That's what you could see, Harry, from a distance in that big sheep pen. Now, as soon as we put this lamb with this little sheepskin covering it into the same pen, you know what the surviving mother did? The surviving mother just went straight over to the newborn lamb and it was like it accepted that creature and said, that's my lamb. That's what the Bible is saying to us, in effect. The moment you put your trust in Jesus, God takes his son's death and his son's good standing and he identifies you so closely, so intimately with his son and his son's death that when he looks at you, he doesn't just think of you and your sin separately. He sees your sin laid on his son. He sees how you've acknowledged Jesus. Have you done that today? And it's as if he walks over to you and he says, now you're mine. When you've become once and for all time identified with Jesus, and that can happen today, when you become once and for all time identified with Jesus' death on the cross, and that can happen today, when you do that by faith and trust, trusting what he's done for you, God comes over to you, the Father says to you, effectively, you're mine. It doesn't matter whether you live five hours from today, five years from today, or five decades from today. The important thing is that you're in a relationship in which God says to you, you are mine. And that's why you can never become more accepted by God the Father, no matter how excellently you live and proceed in following the Christian life, if you begin today to rely on Jesus Christ and his death by trusting only upon his good grace, his death, to save you, then genuine good works will come through your life in time. They'll be ones based on trusting God. And the issue will never be, can you keep it up on your own? Because anything you do on your own will be not very good at all. It'll be what Paul says in Romans 14, verse 23, it'll be sin. When you try to do it on your own. The question then this morning is not can you keep it up, so don't let that be an excuse to postpone you from responding with unbridled trust in Jesus Christ today. Today is the day of salvation. Another businessman was asked a question, a born-again Christian who was asked this question. When you stand before the Lord, what do you think is going to be the first question that he's going to ask you? Well, this businessman was asked that question and he replied, well, 
I don't think God's going to ask me a single question. Theologically, that's a pretty good answer. I think he will look at me and say, you're mine. Now, was that man just being proud? Or was that man putting his hope in the character and the goodness and the grace of God shown to us in Jesus? That's what it was, my friends. Let me sum up, because this is life and death stuff. The gospel invites us. It says, remember, God is not asking you how many good works you've got done. God's acceptance is for the person who does not work for it. God is not asking you how well have you outwardly behaved or how outwardly conformed. God's acceptance of you is a matter of inward believing, not outward behaving. And God is not asking you the question, how long can you keep it up? The moment you accept Jesus Christ, God the Father accepts you and gives you the acceptability of His Son. And that acceptance with God starts in an ongoing relationship in which He enables you to complete the Christian life. He's the one who's going to be with you at the hour of trial or temptation or persecution. You might sense, quite rightly, you haven't got the strength in you to do it on your own. Of course. Without that first acceptance with God, you can do nothing to please Him. But with that acceptance with God, you can easily please and delight a devoted father who loves to see you grow in the Christian life. If you haven't believed in that once and for all time kind of way in Jesus Christ, will you do that this morning? Is the Spirit of God bringing before you the offer of the gospel? Is he speaking to your heart and to your conscience today? If that's so, just pray with me now. Heavenly Father, I want to pray for anyone here today who's never publicly owned and confessed their glad acceptance of Jesus as the rightful master of their life, accepting him as the saviour they know they desperately need. If that's you this morning, say yes to him just like agreeing to get on Blondin's back and letting him carry you away from your sins and their consequences. Can you pray with me? Father, I ask that I be willing to stand for Christ and be openly identified with all of his people here, not secretly, but as a publicly declared, committed disciple of Jesus. I want to follow him. And I'm saying that I'm trusting Christ and I'm admitting that he's my Lord and that he's my desperately needed saviour and I don't care who knows it, I will go wherever he wants me to go. And as for me here, this preacher standing here today, Father, I am trusting you to do your great, gracious work and to finish it in the hearts of everyone here. Grant that everyone here may be, be graced with your conviction of sins your forgiveness of sin, and a most wonderful acceptance of your acceptance in Christ. We all thank you in Jesus' name for that acceptance. So let it be. Amen.